Okay, I'm going to open up the uh, meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's uh, December 6th, 2022, 7.31 p.m. I will um, call to order the uh, special meeting of the Willington Board of Selectmen. It is 7.31 p.m. and note that uh, Selectman Bulick and First Selectman Lucian is here in attendance. Okay, with our uh, uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, members present are uh, Bob Shabbat. Andy Marco, Doug Roberts, Rebecca Sanoski, Joseph Hall, William Bennell, and Michael Johansson. And I will seat Michael Johansson for John T. Hunt, who's, who's not here. All right. No applications for receipt brings us to item D, public hearing. One, public hearing concerning opting out of the provisions of Public Act 21-29 pertaining to accessory dwelling units held jointly with the Board of Selectmen. So just to give a kind of a quick summary or <clears throat> recap, um, in 2021, along with a whole bunch of other stuff that was passed the legislature and we dealt with cannabis and some of the other things, um, one of the other components of the criteria that pertains to the Planning and Zoning Commission relates to how we have to treat um, accessory dwelling units. In our regs, they're referred to as separate family quarters. And uh, I think you guys all have a copy of what's on the books now, just to reference. Um, so there was a, a lot of uh, legislation, a lot of, uh, yep, the one with the yellow. <clears throat> front to back. Um, a lot of legislation passed, um, and parts of it basically mandate that if, if a town does not opt out of the provisions pertaining to um, this, this established criteria, they effectively supersede any language or lack of any language that are in the regulations as of January 1st, 2023. Um, so I outlined all the criteria in the memo, but the highlights are you cannot require that the accessory dwelling unit be occupied by um, someone related to the owner of the property. Can't say it's it's the, in, the old term of in-law apartment, it's essentially gone away. Um, you have to allow them to be attached or detached. Um, you cannot require them to be approved after holding a public hearing. They have to be by right. Um, can't require that they be at least a thousand square feet. Um, can't require that they be on separate utilities or have more restrictive setbacks than you would for something, something similar. Um, so <clears throat> the plan, and I, some of what we have on the books now complies, some of it does not. Um, we had talked about this early on, at, we were gonna look at it as part of the affordable housing plan and after we get the <laughs> cannabis, and then obviously with the PZ, 22-10 application, which took up basically the entire summer. Um, rather than try to get something done by the end of the year, um, opting out gives us the breathing room to take the time as long as we need to evaluate the regulations that we have and make a determination on whether we like them, whether we want to change them. Um, opting out does not prohibit the town from adopting the regulations exactly as outlined by the state. We can, we can look at it, take our time and say, you know what, we agree with it. Um, it just gives us the ability to make those decisions without the someone showing up on January 2nd and saying, hey, I'd like my detached ADU that I'm gonna rent out to X, Y, and Z person. And we would have to give them a permit in the office. Um, the other reason for this is that there is some consensus, but I don't know, the concern, if you will, that we cannot opt out after January 1st, 2023. And should the criteria or the language within um, the legislation change after that, there's a thought that someone could make the argument, well, you can't opt out because it's after January 1st. So now whatever we change in this legislation, you've got to deal with. Probably unlikely, but never hurts to be safe on that. Um, so uh, our commission attorney had recommended that if you're even thinking about it, just opt out because it doesn't 
prevent you from doing anything down the road. The last thing that the requirement includes is that should the Planning and Zoning Commission opt out to make that decision effective, the Board of Selectmen in this case would also have to opt out, which is why they're in attendance at this meeting because they um, need to needs to be done um, by both organizations. So that's uh, the long and short of it, I guess. I agree that the accessory dwelling units require quite a bit more deliberation. And I, I think this is a good option to buy us some breathing room, especially, you know, while we, while we do that. I don't think we want to get, you know, have buyer's remorse here in, a, in three weeks. You know, that undoubtedly there's no <laughs> good stuff in there that we want to consider, but we also want to be able to, you know, go back and forth and discuss among ourselves the pros and cons of, of these different things. So that being said, questions, comments from the commission or, or the uh, selectmen? I agree with yeah. that position. I think it's a good avenue to take. Okay. Is there a time frame that we have to actually review it within and make a decision if we opt out right now? That's a good question. Mike? No. Um, so once we opt out, the regulations that we have on the books will just remain in effect until basically you, you can review them, but you don't actually have to. You can just say we like what we have and opt out and never do anything with it. Um, okay. So it's not like a moratorium in that way where we have some clock. So Mike, from the Board of Selectmen perspective, if, um, if both boards choose to opt out and then the Planning and Zoning Commission makes changes to their current regulations, there's no action after that where the Board of Selectmen are involved. It's just simply this opt out of this new statutory language. Interesting. <laughs> I think that for some towns, you know, particularly with accessory dwelling units, there's a concern. Places like Mansfield obviously has a concern for rentals in, in the whole student market. Places closer to Hartford and as you get south really have, I don't know that they've seen it, but there is concern that it effectively could double the density in certain areas. If you have small lots that are 10,000 square feet and everybody starts putting up, you know, these 200 square foot, three, 400 square, whatever they are, little accessory dwellings in their backyard, you're effectively doubling the densities of your neighborhoods. <clears throat> I don't think that's what anybody has seen, but that's where the concern lies. Um, and a lot of towns still have requirements that these ADUs be Done by special permit, um, which is not allowed per the bill. So you, um, by opting out, we could we could we could adopt all the criteria, but just keep it as a special permit if this commission wanted to review them. So, um, but I guess that's a long way of saying in other places it's a little bit more of a political hot button issue. So I think they tried to make it a more of a community conversation by requiring both boards to make the decision top. So we can choose, you know, if, if, if the decision of the PC is to opt out and the selectmen also agree to opt out, you still have the ability to make additional changes to your regulation, however you feel best suits willing to. Yep. Following the usual planning and building procedures. Okay. Public okay. hearing, referral to CROG, the whole nine years. Yep. Okay. This sounds like it was just a way to kind of not make everybody feel good about process they put in place like giving everyone a voice initially and in the public hearing process if we do you know do move on it next year you know we're going to get the public's input yeah. you know how they feel about this and use it the way in a, a and at that point we're just yes. simply members of the public yes all right any any further comments or questions around this table here all right, let's uh, let's open it up to the public. Anyone in this audience in front of me? Think they have anything to say about it? Uh, yeah. Name, please, and where you live. Uh, it's up here, Hussein, 48 Myrtle Road. Okay. Um, it just brought was brought to my attention because I was looking to put on in-law suite into my house and part of the design process with my wife and just I think it would be. Uh, also taking into consideration the school meeting that I was just in where the mill rate may potentially go up in order to uh, accommodate a new school. 
having something like this maybe you helps offset uh, fixed income individuals who actually have uh, in-law suites or in-law dwellings. I was thinking about the in-law dwelling myself about how long will my in-laws actually be there? I'm gonna build it for, uh, maybe they may be there for 10 years. They won't be here for another 10, maybe here for 10, just for the average lifespan. My mother will come in at 70 and probably leave at 80 just based on statistics. And then, so what do I do with that space it now? Um, I think this gives us the option of not changing the feel of Willington by changing the zoning from a single family residential, which is what we are right now, mostly, to now a, a duplex or apartment building, because now if the next person sells their land and have changed and created an in-law or an ADU, and, that, and their zoning has now changed to a duplex, now you have a new type of development being built in the town, which I'm not sure we would want. So uh, I do like the idea of opting out right now, but I would strongly encourage us to set a timeline of when we would look at these uh, changes because I think it makes Willington attractive for new family members to come in. Thank you. All right, anyone online with, uh, that wants to uh, comment? Is that Ralph, I see. Ralph Toulis. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, Ralph Toulis, 47 Village Hill Road. Uh, I have some questions about this public act. Um, exactly what portion of this act are we opting, opting out of? Because it seems to me there's also a requirement in there uh, that planning and zoning members um, have to attend training. There is. This is accessory dwelling units as a matter of right. I understand, but I, I, I tried reading the public act and uh, it's a nightmare to make sense out of exactly what they're saying. And the consequences of Public Act 21-29 has not been incorporated into the Connecticut General Statutes yet, which is my usual go-to source to um, read through and understand exactly what the legislature is expecting of us and our state's residents. So I, I just want to make sure, you know, I, I, I don't like the idea that we would be forced to accept ADUs wherever someone wanted to do it. Uh, obviously, I, I think, and Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the health department would still have a say in this. I mean, can we put two dwelling units into one septic system? Um, I think that creates an issue for us. Certainly in a more urban or suburban area where you have public sewers, uh, that's kind of a non-issue. Um, and then the other thing is uh, water, potable water. Uh, is that going to be supplied by the original dwelling or is it going to require a separate well, uh, particularly for detached ADUs? So I, I don't have a problem opting out of this. I, I think that's probably a wise move for the town of Wellington. I, I just wanna make sure some of the other more desirable aspects of PA 2129 are kept. And I think we should be more specific with respect to what sections we are opting out of. I noticed another town got a very detailed um, uh, memorandum or, or statement coming from both planning and zoning and the legislative body. Um, what I see from us is something very, very brief. Uh, and I would hope that Mike could speak to that and make it clear for everyone. I think that's all on this topic for now. Thank you, Ralph. Donna Cook. Um, thank you. I, I too attempted to read through Public Act 21-29 and had a lot of concerns. So I am encouraged that you're um, considering opting out, but it looked like you had to opt out of multiple, in multiple spots. Because when I was reading through, it seemed like it was a little repetitive. Um, and so I don't know if there, is there a, uni, well, the question, one of the questions is, is there a universal opt out um, or do you have to do it for multiple spots? Like on their page 12 of 28, it talks about opting out. And then um, I saw it then again, 
in another spot, which I cannot get my fingers on right now. So that was one thing. And, and the other thing is it looked like this was um, going to require you to have a plan to increase affordable housing at least once every five years to re to re look at the plan and and that way. Um, what percentage of our housing in Wellington is considered affordable housing right now? Seven percent. And what percentage are we do they want everybody to have? Ten percent. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but I believe that's correct. You want me to touch on some of the yeah, why don't you just touch on it a little bit? We're not opting out of all of affordable no. housing. I want you to make that clear. There really are only two two components to the act that you can opt out of. This this one and another one related to the number of parking spaces that you can require for a multifamily basically can't require more than one per unit, which is not inconsistent with what we have anyways. You can't opt out of the commissioner training or really any other provision. When does that uh, take effect? Because we're going to have to consider that the commissioner training. The commissioner training yeah. is, um, it's it rolls out beginning in 2023, but it's, okay. there's sort of, it'll be phased in that there's there's going to be some stuff that they're- it's Four presenting. hours, right? Right, and there's things yeah. they're presenting now, which you can basically watch the recording of. Okay. It will be easily obtained. Right. But the, the the legal notice that was run and the way that it was listed on the agenda is a public hearing concerning opting out of the provisions of Public Act 2129 pertaining to accessory dwellings, because that's what we're focusing on now. Um, so the other questions, uh, this, but there are specifics within the act which basically say that we cannot require that that um, the dwelling accessory dwelling unit be served by separate utilities and that the health department cannot treat them as community wastewater systems. So under current provisions, if you have two buildings discharging to the same system, it elevates the re review requirement with the health department. So the bill basically says if it's a detached ADU, um, you can't look at it that way. So we can, we can overtax a septic system or we can overtax a well? No, it just, it just means that they look at it like if you were adding a bedroom above your, in a bonus room of your garage. Rather than making the ADU perhaps build an entirely separate septic system, they can show that the design of the current system can support an increase in one bedroom and have that, that unit discharged to the existing septic. And I'm not a health expert, but there's language in the bill to basically make it not a complete barrier. Um, but they still have to go through all the health criteria to demonstrate flow and design capacity reserve. All of that stuff is the same. Um, so one other thing I wanted to touch on. So as a follow-up um, to what was just said, I know when we built our house, we decided to erase a wall and remove a bedroom because in order to accommodate the number of bedrooms, I was told that when the, there's a formula based upon two people per bedroom living there all year round. And it really didn't matter how big my personal family was because if we sold our house, it could accommodate a much larger family. And so the septic system had to be able to accommodate that. So we changed our floor plan to remove a room because the additional cost 20 years ago to have the appropriate septic system was gonna be an additional $20,000. So um, I would hope that if someone putting in an accessory building at any point in time, that that would be carefully reviewed because that, that's a, an extensive cost. And you know, we're all, most of us are on uh, septic here and, and well water, so that has to be taken care of. So, all right, thank you so much for your time. And, um, and I hope that willing, it sounds like you guys wanna opt out and I'm hoping Willington does opt out of this. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. The other thing I just wanted to add related was related to affordable housing. So the other thing that the, the language includes is that, you know, we're all trying to get to this 10%, which is this goal that was established that for towns that aren't there and aren't close, it's going to be really hard to ever do. But the but every time you add a dwelling unit, 
you're moving further away from your 10%. So, you know, the, I, there was some concern that encouraging accessory dwelling units, we're gonna add dwelling units to the books. So if we add a thousand dwelling, accessory dwelling units, now our percentage is gonna get drastically reduced. So, right. so it, it also specifically states that any a, a accessory dwelling unit that is added does not count towards the, the total unit count for the purposes of determining the 7%. So if we add 100 accessory dwelling units, that's not gonna take us 100 units further from our 10% goal. So they're not included in the count. <laughs> they, don't, they want it to be something that, that towns, you know, at least consider and encourage in some way. Um, so it won't make, it, it won't affect our, our focus on 10%. Okay, any, uh, any further questions from anyone in the public? Comments. Just a clarification. Go ahead. You said that, uh, just to clarify, the accessory dwelling. Uh, your name once oh, again. Sorry, yeah, sorry, each time. Yeah. 48 yeah. Yeah. Um, Would the accessory dwelling units add add to our 7% and get us closer to the 10%? Or are you saying it would take us further away from? It's a wash. It's a wash. Yeah. If they were deed restricted as affordable, then it would add to the 7 but if we just added it as a, and you rented it out to, or had a family member occupy it, it wouldn't then take us further away because now we've added another unit. Okay. Uh, um, is there wording in the legislation that we're opting out of, of how much the unit would need to be rented at in order to be considered affordable? Would have to be deed restricted for a period of 40 years at 30% uh, restricted. Deed restricted. So the seven and change that we have now are effectively. Um, the same housing. housing yeah and so those are deed restricted and so to qualify outside of any type of federal housing or any you know some of the other larger projects deed restricted for 40 years at, at um 30 percent of 80 percent of area median income which is established by HUD. Right. so we would run the calculation which is adjusted every year we have the same address so if I put one at my house, 48 Myrtle Road, mm -hmm. it'd be 48 Myrtle Road would be the mailing address for this ADU as well. Yeah, more than Even likely. It's deeded for 40 years to be an affordable AMI. So the only thing that would just, you would have to, ver to get, you would just have to verify that whoever was occupying that unit had the income that met that criteria. Um, and so you, it would be deed restricted. And in Willington, we've run the numbers. It's north of $1,000. Uh, it's probably in the 1,200 range would be my guess. You adjust it based on bedroom count and some other stuff. But right? um, it, it's not like $300 a month or something like that. But the, the hang up why we don't see it very often is because it's 40 years. Um, <clears throat> and then after 40, it comes off, that restriction comes off the book. So even if you continue to rent it, if the deed restriction doesn't remain, it doesn't count towards the percentage. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Looks like we don't have any more questions. Anything other for from the select uh, select uh, man, select woman, or the commission? I'm good. All right, I understand. It. Can I? I just want to make sure I understand. We're not, there's two sections, right? Mike said the ADU section as well as the parking minimum section. We're, we're right. not doing that tonight. We're not. We're, we're not, not taking up that at this all. This is tonight. just. This is just for the accessory dwelling units. Do we have to opt out of the parking minimum? We're not. Re it's minimum? not really different than what we have. It's, so there's no. There's no change that you know. It's not like we require four spaces per unit because we don't allow multi. We don't, we don't have, you can't have apartments, you know, we can't have a 25 unit apartment here. So we don't have this parking standard, which says we can only require one space per unit. It, it doesn't, uh, there's no language which it would really supersede. And, and it's, yeah, that's. So by not opting out of that mm -hmm. and your discussion about changes later on that could come to the act. Are we now beholden to that because we didn't choose to take any direction on our own? Is there is there some risk there? I think that was what was most sort of tricky for me when we when that was mentioned because you can only opt out of specific provisions mm -hmm. and there's two of them. And whether you opt out of one or two, if they add a third, 
you couldn't opt out of something that didn't exist prior to the, it coming into play. Um, so I think it was more related to if you know they changed something to say accessory dwelling units now, you know, I don't know, don't need a septic system. I don't know, something crazy. If they change the requirements for the specific provision, which you could have opted out of. Um, as far as the parking goes, I don't know what they could do for parking calculations for multifamily. Um, I'm not sure how that would really be modified. That would be something that like, would be cause for concern. I mean, we have the option to opt out. We don't. I just want to make sure we yeah. understand if there's any risk involved in not can you imagine, taking that. Can you imagine if you build a multifamily building, you have enough parking there. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I mean, effectively, <laughs> they build what they know they need. Um, but doesn't happen here, but it happens. Yeah. You know, it certainly more does. Often, yes, more often than I suppose not, which is why. I know, I know Boston has that. Yeah. Yeah, the easy answer is we advertise it as an opt out for the ADU. So that's all we can do tonight. Anyways, we can certainly talk about it at the next meeting if we want. Well, I was just yeah. going to say because you're in the same time frame, yeah. so we we have the time. Right. We have one more meeting. This if we if yeah, I mean if we, if we all right if we need okay. It. All right. So procedurally, what would I close this like? Uh, you know, make a motion to close this like any other public hearing. Even okay, they don't have to make any motion of their own. The statute doesn't even expressly require that they have their own public hearing. So okay. basically, this is a right. planning zone of mirror. We're doing it right. It'd be hard for them to opt out of something if they hadn't heard what anybody had to say about it. All right. I'm going to uh, make a motion. Did, did Andy want to say anything? Andy. On you, camera. Andy. I just want to make sure. You want to say anything? If we can't hear you, Andy. He's talking, but there's no sound. Andy. Looks like an old karate movie. <laughs> We'll dub it in. <laughs> he can hear us. All right. Yeah, we see you. We can't hear you. Train. Train. We'll All right. I think your sound is on the fritz there, Andy. Check your microphone. Turn up your volume or something. Okay. Plug in some headphones, maybe that's the fix. It's a mic, definitely a mic. Headphones with a mic. We've been doing this long enough. You know he got it. Yeah. All right, you there, Andy? Andy could phone in. He could phone in. He's trying to sign language. Just now. <laughs> All right. Scribble on a piece of paper and hold it up. Type in the chat. Nah, I think he's good. He just waved it off. All right. All right. All right. I'm going to uh, make a motion to uh, close public hearing uh, concerning opting out of provisions of public act. 21-29 pertaining to accessory dwelling units. And it was held jointly with the Board of Selectmen. So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Which brings us on to uh, item number two, PZ-22-18, text amendment pertaining to modifications of 5.05.01.02. Got two four. <laughs> two for dimensional requirements. Applicant Joseph Williams. Uh, if you don't mind, I got some notes in my phone. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm Patrick Pedosio with Suncap Property Group. It's Ben Cherry. Uh, we're the developers for the, the project. And Joe Williams is our land use council. Um, we this is our uh, third meeting in as many months on this text amendment. <laughs> Uh, for the purpose of one, making the text consistent on uh, surface parking being an approved use in the DI zone, and two, uh, basically reconstituting a 50% um, in allowable impervious coverage to be applicable in a surface parking lot where it's affiliated with a warehouse distribution user within a mile of the parking lot. Um, so I want to recap the first couple of meetings. For, you know, I know a lot of Can I bring one thing up? This is a continuation from the last meeting, by the way. This is the Correct. same public hearing. We can it was continued. So just Correct. for the record. Yeah, and I know yeah. some some folks were not present at the last meeting. So um and then I'll uh, uh, and I also want to hit some of the question outstanding questions and comments that we talked about the last one. And then before handing it off to uh, Joe to kind of review the text amendment itself. Um, and then, you know, 
I'd like to ask the commission to, to make a decision on the matter tonight um, if, if it feels so, so compelled. Uh, so in our first, first meeting, we introduced the proposed text amendment and the commission responded with questions about site plan, uh, who the user was, uh, traffic impact concerns, um, really wanted to know what it was that we were doing. Um, and uh, we, we kind of just deferred giving answers until the next meeting because um, we weren't able to really give a whole lot of information. And so we came back, we uh, brought a site plan, presented a site plan, and who the user was the, this is it's going to be overflow parking for cars vans tractor trailers uh, for the fedex facility on ruby road um, and it's about a mile south of the fedex facility so traffic will be limited to that one mile stretch of ruby road um, and we also um, kind of reiterated that this project was going to be subject to osto approval so to kind of uh, ease some of the concerns about traffic. Um, and then uh, at the second meeting, or at that second meeting, the, uh, the town still expressed some concerns, concerns about traffic and also about the uh, surrounding land around the FedEx while we weren't developing there. And those were kind of the main takeaways that we, we brought from that second meeting. Um, and, uh, with regard to the surrounding land, we discussed with the end user as well as the Army Corps engineers, and um, the, the end user did consider that as an option initially and uh, really quickly turned away from it when they learned that there was a conservation easement on that land. And, um, but we, we still had a conversation with the Army Corps to talk about what it would take. And basically it's a, it's a lengthy, minimum 18 month process, as well as astronomical costs is kind of we would expect. And uh, it re would require concurrence from, uh, from state and local as well as the core. And we're not likely to get at least the core. They, they admittedly said the purpose of these conservation <coughs> easements is to have the land set aside in perpetuity. So it kind of defeat the purpose for them to um, relinquish that. And so the likelihood of us being able to make that happen is just ex extremely low. Um, we, we're still willing to continue those conversations as we move forward. Just uh, don't think it has necessarily an impact on the text amendment that we're uh, here to talk about today. Um, with regard to the traffic concerns, again, we are going to go through OSTA, but we understand that um, the that the OSTA process may not adequately address those concerns. So. We have had conversations with the town about some potential um, alternate um, modified plans that would address other concerns and we're willing to continue those conversations um, as we move forward with the project. Again, you know, we don't think that's necessarily germane to the text amendment that we're, we're talking about tonight. Um, and I, I think the main factor we hope the commission will consider is uh, really a com uh, commitment to supporting its existing, existing industrial users within the DI zone. Uh, we think our proposal is, is not intrusive to the town, especially compared to other allowable uses within the DI zone. Um, and we understand the town has legitimate concerns and will cooperate as much as possible to address those um, throughout the process. But in order to do, the, do that, we need a decision on the text amendment so we can advance design and have those conversations and figure out ways to address those concerns. Um, so I think with that, yeah, I'll turn it over to, to Joe to kind of give a little further detail about the text amendment. So thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Joe Williams, I'm a partner at Shipman and Goodwin, One Constitution Plaza in Hartford. I've practiced land use law in the state of Connecticut for a little over 28 years. Um, just to add to what Patrick was saying and to recap for the folks who weren't here for the first night of the public hearing, um, as Patrick said, we have proposed an amendment to your zoning regulations that does two things. First, clarifies that the use of surface parking lots is an allowed use in the DI zone where it already allows garages. And you have a table of uses that also um, specifies that surface parking lots are allowed. So this amendment would just bring the text of the regulation consistent with what you already have in your table to allow surface parking lots. 
And then second, <coughs> um, with regard to maximum lot coverage, as you probably know, you have, a, you have the, uh, section eight, you have a table of dimensional requirements where for some of the zones, it just gives one number total maximum coverage for a property. And then for other zones, it splits it one number for building coverage and one number for pavement coverage. And in the DI zone, it has the split 25% each, 25% coverage for building, 25% coverage for pavement. What we're pro proposing to do is keep that total of 50 the same, but just state 50 and not split it between 25% to building and 25% so for pavement. So our, our goal is to propose the minimum change possible, maintain the overall 50% impervious coverage cap that you already have in the regulation, but allow the one side or the other building or pavement to go beyond 25%, between 25 and 50, uh, because the parking lot proposal that we would like to bring before you, if you adopt the text amendment, will propose something in the 30s, 33, 34%, somewhere in there. Um, but we also added some restrictions to not make it universal. So we added language to footnote one in the table that states a DI lot may exceed 25% coverage for overflow surface parking associated with an offsite use only if the other use is a warehouse package distribution facility located in Willington within a one mile radius of the parking lot. And the total lot coverage for building and pavement does not exceed 50%. So it restates the 50%. And it says that a pave, pavement for an overflow parking lot can only go above 25% if it's for what we want, the type of thing that we want to propose, which is overflow parking to a warehouse or distribution facility, and it's within one mile. So it limits the potential properties in town that would be able to, to make use of that language. And I'm happy to answer questions about it. I have a question. Uh, this is for cars as well as trailers and so forth. So how yes. I'm assuming the cars are for employees. How do how do the people get from the lot back to the facility? They run a, a shuttle. How does this how does this work? It's a mile away. Yeah. So ultimately, majority of the parking is for trailers, not tractors and trailers. There's some additional parking for vans and tractors. Okay. So the idea is if they need to pick up a trailer, they obviously have a tractor to the facility, go to the offsite parking, pick up the trailer, and then go back to the facility or some other facility that may be in the area. So they got like a yard horse like type. Correct. Come down and then the down. idea is if they're picking up a van or a yeah. tractor and they need to pick a trailer from somewhere else, they would park their car. The parking for the actual equipment is secured. They can walk through a turnstile, grab the van or tractor, and then drive to where they need to go, mostly back to the facility, leave their car. And then obviously, as they're done with that, drop it off, pick up their car. Like if I, I'm just like not having a good vision in my head of like somebody walking down, down no, the road, no. the FedEx in the dark, down that winding road. Yeah. No, there's no implication for anybody to walk. And we've also seen people ride together to somebody in a van, drop somebody off off to get a van if there's not a car involved, so it's a, it's a... I can tell you my number one concern is just thinking of that road as is and, you know, the, the traffic and so forth on it, because uh, even going to the dump, you know, you got to watch it with cars coming up over the hill and so forth, and not everybody follows the speed limit, and, then, you know, just that, that's a major concern of mine, you know, the addressing the, the state of the road as it presently sits with and, and, and it is a subject we will thoroughly review and vet and discuss and present to you. If you if you pass this amendment, you're not saying our project can go forward, you're just amending the regulations. Then we would go meet with engineers, do all of the thorough preparation of a plan, including a traffic study, a full traffic study, and file an application for special permit. So we would come back before you, have a public hearing, traffic engineer would present, you'd see the study, um, and all of those issues would be looked at. Um, and then we would also have to do the same type of thing, not a public hearing necessarily, but we would have to present a traffic study to state DOT and OSTA 
uh, to get their approval as well. So um, there's a lot of a lot of sets of eyes that will be looking at the traffic. Just issue. DOT sometimes, you know, the bare minimum will happen, and it's still, you know, yeah. relatively unsafe. We had these concerns even when we had a truck stop recently go in and everything. That was one of the number one things that the public talked about. And we just got to make sure we don't mm -hmm. recreate a, another situation like that. Yeah, and we have had preliminary conversations, bouncing ideas, kind of back and forth about how to make this as safe of a, uh, access to Ruby Road as possible, as well as whatever traffic is along Ruby Road. We just haven't had the capacity to advance design because we're waiting to see what happens with the text amendment. So we'll, we'll continue those conversations and our motives are in line. We want it to be safe. We don't want, we don't want incidents or accidents there either. You know, it is our end user. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're on the same page there, I think. Any uh, questions from the commission? Uh, yeah, just one. Comments, guys. Yeah. So you're asking for us to go from 25% coverage for a parking lot to 50. Usually the building is 25% and the parking lot is 25%. So if we let you, if we doubled the amount of paved parking lot on that site, could you use, if it was just 25% parking, could you only use that much chemical to control the snow? What I'm saying is you're asking us to let you put 100 times 50% more chemicals in that area that are subject to runoff and subject to leaching into the brook that's on that low end where you yourself had said, that that would be where your retention basins would be. So are you planning on doing something using chemicals like the airports do? So it's not corrosive. So it is more easily uh, taken up into the landscape. I think that the stormwater runoff Calculation. I, mean, I don't know the particular. Well, I'm just asking. I don't know the particular ways that you guys handle handle stormwater runoff, particularly here. But in, in most jurisdictions, there's calculations that involve the amount of impervious coverage that dictate what you have to do in terms of treatment. Yeah. And we'll absolutely be doing those and complying with. Well, you have to hire an engineering firm as part of. Yes, yeah. we will absolutely have an engineering firm. In addition. Well, uh, but uh, I mean, the fact is, is that you're doubling the amount of Excellent. hard surface. That means you're doubling the amount of runoff. You're doubling for five months, um, say that. You have to put some kind of material down for uh, snow and ice. I, I get with the material, a flat roof's a hard surface too, even though you don't treat it with chemicals. Well, you don't run off, you're gonna well, catch that's, that's, the building, that's the big right? difference between 25% yeah. on the building yeah, and 25% parking. That is the, it's the treatment for the snow and ice of building. You know, you, you're still gonna get runoff, but it's not gonna be treated. Right, right. Well, you haven't yeah. got any chemicals. To, well, hopefully. You don't have- Unless your cooling tower's you're, leaking. Or something. You, yeah. you don't have- uh, snow and ice melting material running off of the roof. It, it's a very appropriate question and it will it will be closely reviewed and discussed. As the chair said, we'll be getting civil engineers much more involved and they will be released to do the whole thing and to, to present a stormwater management plan as part of our application to you when we come back, if we come back on the next phase. Mm -hmm. So yes, that would be looked at and you know part of any stormwater management component of an application is often an operation and maintenance plan in which you can look at exactly what we what you will be using and you know will it be affecting resources nearby and that sort of thing so that's all right for discussion definitely yeah. that's all i have i, I do have a question okay. and maybe i'm just not seeing this right so you're changing the lot to 50 percent what's to say someone comes in here and decides to build a building that's 50% with no paved coverage if they're just going to leave everything bare ground for their parking. What's to stop someone from putting a building up 50% with the way this is worked? It doesn't stop that. It would have to be ancillary to an existing warehouse distribution used within a mile of the property. So, it would It would be precluded to some extent because you can't put up a, a building. I mean, the parcel is how big? 
just under 20. So a 50% coverage on a parcel of 20 acres is a 10 acre building. We have minimum parking requirements. So X per thousand spaces, you could never put up a building with no parking unless you said you had indoor parking or something, but- I, I'm just yeah. curious because it, you know, playing devil's advocate right. used to say, you know. No, it's a good point, but but we would <clears throat> not allow someone to just build up a building and say, no, no, I'm just gonna use it for storage. I don't need parking because based on the building size and the use, there would be a demand for a number of spaces which the regs would require. It could be still be low, um, but they'd have to do something based upon whatever that use was. Even right. if it were just storage. Theoretically, under the coverage limit, the building can be 50, but realistically, when you apply the other regulations, it's impossible because you're going to have to have driveways and parking and different things that would have to ratchet that building percentage down. The only question that I have, I want to confirm, this is a, this it truly is a parking lot. It is not a, for lack of a better word, a, 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 like a truck stop. You're not going to have a tractor and a trailer come in, park, and idle for four hours until space frees up at the facility and then move. This is going to be sort of dead storage, no idling, no perpetual moving. Correct. Okay. Then as you can imagine, then, stuff. Yeah, the end user doesn't want the truck idling there. That doesn't make any of they, they want to be as efficient as possible. So dropping off, picking up, and then leaving. So this is basically empty trailers going to be dropped here and they're going to be picked up and brought to the loading docks. And Majority, yes. There's areas for vans that would be, I think about 60 or just under 70 parking spots is for vans. That would be the vans you see driving around. And then, yeah, some employee parking too. <coughs> Maybe I have another question. Go ahead. So just looking at your layout, how much further back are you going to remove uh, rock from the uh, where the where the rock face is now up to that second level? How far back are you going to go beyond that? I'm, I'm not sure. Approximately. I'm not. I think the topo. I'm not sure on the distance. If you can see, we go all the way back to the wetland buffer. We obviously okay. do not want to go into the wetland buffer. That's right. so that's kind of. I'm not sure. We can. We could probably overlay it a little better. Well, they've never used to be there yet. You know, but they were blasting that second level now. Yeah, I'm not sure on the exact distance from where that oh, okay. rock face yeah. is to come back. Yeah. We can we can find it together that would be cool. Bear in mind, we're still in you know, conceptual oh, yeah. plane. No, I was just, you know, I drove past the other day and get on the train floor and I looked up and I said, hmm, I wonder how much further back it's We've got to need to level that out. Yeah. So you, you guys are trying to get this this uh, text amendment before you go any further to see if it's basically worth your while before you spend the. Yeah, exactly. there's, there's a point where it, if we, that's what they'd like to do. And obviously, the finance is involved here. We need to spend more finances if we need to. Yes. But that site plan is just temporarily. I mean, that's obviously what we have today. We're open to adjust that as needed. That's Mike, didn't you have a document that had other towns as far as comparison goes? They submitted it during the hearing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it included Coventry, Ellington, Union, Tolland, Ashford, Stafford, and Mansfield. I may have a couple more copies of that if you want to see that? I'm sorry to interrupt. I may have a couple more copies of that since I have it if you'd like to see it. I've seen it, but I yeah. Know. yeah, I'd like to have a copy. Sure. Coventry, uh, sixty percent. Ellington, sixty. Union, twenty-five. Special permit may be issued for increase beyond. Tolland, sixty. Ashford, seventy-five. Stafford, depending on the height of the building, between fifty and down thirty, and then Mansfield, twenty-five uh, percent. That's a lot of the towns are recording more. It is a fairly low. <clears throat> Three more on me. Anybody else want Thank you. This is good. I guess my other point that I want to bring up is that traffic studies. I mean, there was a lot of concern over loves um, and the credibility of the traffic study. And I have to say, because I go by there every time I have to use 84. Um, I think they were spot on. Um, I think it split the traffic. 
I'm not waiting um, because of congestion congestion at the TA. So I think you know truckers know that if the TA is busy, they're going to go to Loves. So it has helped, I think, improve it. So they still run into the opposing lane, though. Um, they do, but I think people are more aware now that with their uh, a business up on the hill, they're actually looking the other way. Yeah. yeah. Where before they weren't, they would just come off baby four, you know, going westbound and just take the left hand turn. Right. Yeah. So. Right. Other uh, other questions or comments from the commission? <laughs> Is there any thought to doing some of the? I know we're, they're starting new ways of paving, so it's more permeable is there any thought to doing more of the permeable covers instead of the total solid asphalt where everything looks off yeah. so yeah we, we touched on that on the last meeting we have looked at the permeable um, based on kind of the chemicals that are used the permeable becomes clogged and almost defeats the purpose and it causes the asphalt to actually fail faster so it's in this kind of climate it's not really the best solution just based on just the weather and the maintenance kind of back to the original comments with the chemicals. So it is done before, but it's uh, not the best practice. And then Generally, we, from what we've heard, speaking, when we were looking into this, we spoke with some engineers about who have worked with the impervious or the permeable pavement. They say within three years, most of them are impervious because they get clogged up. They say the issue is you don't have, then you don't have a stormwater system designed through. We, way back before I had any discussions with them, their DL who's doing the site design, Chris and I met with them and based upon the way our regulations are set up, I don't think we can give them credit for impervious or pervious pavers. I don't think that would reduce their total coverage. I think we, based upon our read and their read, even a pervious paver would still count towards coverage because we don't track impervious and just lot coverage. So based upon maintenance, the way that the regs were set up, um, we, we basically felt like they still would probably run into the, the issue. <clears throat> okay, further questions from the commission before I move on to the public. All right, public, anyone in this room have anything to say? Okay, good, let's go to uh, online. I see Mr. Coolis. Yes, uh, I will go back to the same comment that I made in the previous uh, public hearing in um, Table 8.02. Ralph, you your name and address for the record. Ralph, all right, sorry, Ralph Tulis, 47 Village Hill Road. Uh, I should be used to that by now. Uh, in Table 8.02, I see no need to put 50% in that column. Leave the 25% uh, buildings, 25% pavement. Uh, footnote one in the left column refers you down to um, the text that they want to add that would allow uh, in a DA zone, uh, allow them to exceed 25% coverage. And their goal is set and we don't mislead subsequent applications. And we still have the ability to consider 25 plus 25. I, I think deleting the two 25 percent from the table is is a mistake. Uh, let the footnote address this specific condition, this specific applicant. Um, it, it, if you move forward with this, that's what I think makes sense. They get what they want, but we don't mislead future applicants. Um, unless I'm really stupid and missing something here. So I welcome any further comments on it. I got a comment on that, Ralph. <laughs> it's a joke. All right. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Yes, uh, is sir. Zephyr Hussein, 48 Harbor Road. I hear that they want to change the textbook. Why couldn't we just keep the text as is and provide them a special permit instead? Um, that's just a question for the board. Um, it seems like some other towns, as you're rattling off in percentages, uh, do allow a special permit. So just looking at that alternative, instead of going down the path of changing something that's specific to this one plan, 
where it's already written, why don't we use it to go to a special permit? That's my question. Thank you. So um, special permits can be issued, but they have to be issued in accordance with the regs. So the they got to change the reg first, and then the, the development of the site will require a special permit. But towns, commissions can't modify or waive the requirements for certain users or applicants. So they have to change this first to establish the baseline, and then they will come back for a special permit. It, sorry. There's, there's no way to make the special permit the amendment to the requirement? No. So the requirement supersedes all special permit or dictates the direction all special permits go. Exactly. It's a baseline of criteria that everybody's held to. And then the type of approval the commission establishes, special permit, site plans, whatever. But it all is based upon the zoning regs. It has to be compliant with those standards. They can't waive those. Ralph's suggestion was interesting. Yeah. I'll just put it in the note instead to the specific, but that changes it for just the specific site. Yes. If it's a substantive change, there's limitation on what we can do now that it's been advertised as such. Uh, and I don't know. Could we change the special zoning or a special permit to add this note rather than that in that location? Because it seems like it's so unique that, that to have it in the regular specs seems just too specific to this um, proposal versus moving it over to the special permit where now we have that flexibility. It might work. So I think one of the things that the commission may want to think about first is, is the 50% rule. Yes, it's a 20, it's a, it is a change. We're going from what was 25 to 50, but is 50 completely out of line for an industrial zone parcel? Not when you look at other towns. If the answer is no, then tweaking all this stuff doesn't matter. If the answer is yes, then we can figure out if there's another way to get there. So really it's, <laughs> our regulations are not this easy to use document anyway, so I don't know how many people go through them and say, oh, okay, this is what we'll do. Um, we usually have to all sit together and figure out what they say. Um, but so I think if we figure out what you think about the 50 in, in this limited case, because again, it's not just a, a wide open 50, and then we can figure out if we need to make changes from there, but just have to be careful with how we notate it so that it, it doesn't look like we've made changes beyond what was advertised. I think we can get there. All right, uh, online, Nick Tella. Hey, Nick Tella, 49 Myrtle. Just a clarif clarification. So if, if this went through the 50%, would this only be for DI or would it be for DI, R80 and different different uh, areas or is it just DI? DI. Okay, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> within a one mile radius. All right. Further questions uh, from the public or comments? I think we're good. All right, I'm gonna uh, make a motion to close PZ-22-18 text amendment pertaining to modifications of 5.05.01.02.24 and table 8.02 for dimensional requirements, applicant Joseph Williams. Yes, sir. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, public hearings uh, closed on that, which brings us to, uh, Item E, unfinished business. And this is the consideration of opting out of the provisions of Public Act 21-29 pertaining to accessory dwelling units. And we're gonna have a discussion with the select that we just paid the discussion with us. All right, any, any discussion on this one? Well, what's the thought about uh, voting on this one tonight? I think we don't want everybody in agreement. Okay, Andy. Okay. I think he said that. Oh. <clears throat> Frustrating. 
right. Can, can I just <laughs> yes, ask, go ahead. since this yeah. is the one item on, on our agenda as well. So Jim, do you feel like the public cares enough to give um, you a, as a member of this board enough information to take action for the board of selectmen? Yeah, I think we can just do that. Okay. My recommendation is that we take um, our action after such time as the PCC has taken their action. Sounds good. And my one question is, um, are we shooting from the hip here, Mike? I didn't see a proposed motion. I see your recommendation. But is there a proposed language for the motion? Um, I don't have a proposed motion, okay. but we would basically just be a motion to opt out of and as written in the in the agenda pertaining to. I have, I mocked up. Uh, yeah. A proposal. I can. So I just um, didn't want. I figured we had the same. Thank you. Does one the one of the other commissioners want to make this motion? Let me give it a shot. Go for it. Uh, I move that we, the Planning and Zoning Commission, opt out of Public Act twenty one twenty nine pertaining specifically to accessory dwelling units only. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Discussion. Good. All right, so I will uh, make a motion uh, to opt out of provisions of Public Act 21 29 pertaining to accessory uh, dwelling units. I'll second that. All right, so second. Any discussion? Any discussion? None. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, with that, and no other business for the Board of Selectmen. I will make a motion to adjourn our portion of the meeting at 832. I'll second that. Not the fatal matter. We're adjourned. Uh, we don't have to stay. <laughs> Just a quick housekeeping should Can I run it as a joint notice of decision or will yeah. you guys own? Okay. So I'll run it as a, run it as a joint. Okay. Um, and we will um, somehow try to make a note of you know, the, we obviously did the quarter round meeting. It will be one joint meeting. Folks can listen in and get all kinds of stuff. Just put a link or something like that. Yeah. I'll well, run the no I'll run the, link. the legal notice of decision to say on such and such the board of selectmen and planning zoning held a joint public hearing. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. So we saw. I, I do think it's important to note now, Mike, that the um the process needs to be by two thirds majority. Obviously, unanimous. We are a three member board of which we are currently down. We have a vacancy, so we are currently a two member board. So, without question, we could have. So, if anyone has a question, right? Anyway. Just in, in the event there is a question, um, so we are, we are a two member board. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. I right, don't be offended if you choose our consent. Not, no, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't want to sit around the exciting. Like two or four. You can, you can make some answers. <laughs> Good night. Okay. So it brings us to PZ 22 18. This is the text amendment uh, pertaining to the modifications of 5.05.01.02.24, table 8.02 for the pensional requirements. Applicant Joseph Williams. All right, discussion around this. Uh, first of all, Mike, is this something that we should like make a formal motion around how we want to this and have it spelled out clearly? If you end up in a position where you're making a lot of changes, yes. This is because of the way it was written. I didn't prepare anything because not a lot of modifications necessarily to be made. So depending on where you guys land, we can talk about it. I can also just draft something up here based on what you guys decide. All right, how's the commission feel about moving on this one tonight? I am as well. How about you, Bob? Yeah, I just think we need some clarification about the uh, quote unquote 50%. Okay. Do we want to try to wordsmith something here? So, what do you elaborate on what you mean by clarification? So I can. I, I'm thinking about Ralph, what Ralph had. Uh, made mention of. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I'd like to see something like that come about. So you want to strike the, you want to leave the table as is, 
So that, which comes to my first point, right? Because effectively the way that it was changed, yeah, there is some <clears throat> potential for your total coverage will never exceed 50%. You, your total lot coverage will never exceed the 50. That doesn't change. The, the previous... It's just they simply want to make it up in asphalt versus having a building. And because because the lot coverage, and they talked about this at the first meeting, because the way that a regs were written with 25 and 25, they only need 30 something. So the easiest thing for them to do would have just be to change 25 to 35. That gets them what they want. But that what that then does is it does potentially increase the total coverage because you can have a building at 25 and then a parking lot at 35. So rather than do that, which gives you a net increase, they changed it to be a total combined of 50. So that if someone exploits the regs to their fullest extent, it gets them less than what they would have normally because they have no intentions of building a building. Um, if someone were to put a building on the property after they put it put up the site, they're going to be limited to the total coverage. They don't then get another 25%. Um, the way it's drilled down, it's still, when you're talking about the increase beyond for surface parking lots within, you know, there's so many qualifying criteria. Yeah. We don't even have another use that could establish such FedEx is the only user in the DI zone that meets the criteria to even be able to establish such a use. There's not like there's another user that could come in and say, I'm going to do the same thing because they don't have that operation. Um, so we couldn't, we could tweak that. Um, it seems like the 50% is in line with what other towns are doing. I yeah. see that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just looking at it so, as like yeah. a Rubik's cube. You know, you change one, and then yeah. everything else doesn't necessarily <coughs> fall into place. Right. No. Right. The total is the total. So if you have a 20% well, yeah. building coverage. No, you know, I'm, I'm understanding that, but I'm thinking about the Rubik's Cube in the back of my mind. Too. Yeah, I understand that. But in my mind, we're looking at a parking lot. Right. My main concern is the traffic and so forth, which is yeah. a matter for another day's discussion. That's true. That's right. And, you know, they want to kind of decide whether this is viable or not based on, yeah. on what we do here. And uh, I think that's where we're at. So that being said, what do we want to do tonight? I just have a quick question. Is ahead. there any off chance with all the other regulations that someone could come in and build a building bigger than 25% and keep that, you have 50% say you want to to do the reverse, like 35% building and 15% parking. Is that possible? I just want to make sure. For a building to go beyond 25%? Yeah. Yes. But the total lot coverage would still be stopped. Stop at 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50%. But I mean, they could potentially put a really big building, but we only want 25%. Building. But you gotta have so much parking to fit. Yeah. They still have to meet parking and setbacks and, and all of those other criteria. Yes, it is. And so and this is just different ways to skin the same cat, but okay. at the end of the day, you typically want your parking to be, you do not want to have 50% of the coverage to be parking. You typically want to see less parking than you have for a building. Mm -hmm. If we have five acres of building, we don't want five acres of parking. You typically want the building to be the mass of coverage and then have parking. We're trying to move away from having massive seas of parking. So in this case, yes, you could have, um, it, what you outlined, but but still, based upon the, the note, a DI zone lot may exceed 25% lot coverage for overflow surface parking associated with. So there's still that qualifier. It's not opening up everything. Sounds like a speaker speech. Oh, I heard something. I thought it was, um, but yes, in theory, there's there is some opportunity. But it still is going to cap. It's still going to cap out the total at 50. All right, so, okay, so we're in unfinished business, but I see this appears again under new business, so if we're going to vote on it, we probably should grab what, yeah, that was, what's it, going on here. Yeah. It shouldn't be under vote. Okay, all right, so we'll deal with it right now. As I'm confused a bit there, seeing that. Uh, all right, so I'm going to make a motion to, uh, to approve EZ-22-18 text amendment pertaining to 
modifications of 5.05.01.02.24 and table 8.02 uh, for dimensional requirements applicant Joseph Williams. We have a second. I'll second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All abstain. Okay. So what did we get here? How many? What did Andy do? Andy. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll see you soon. Oh, we'll see you. Yeah. Good luck. Can we make one recommendation when you're doing your parking planning Please. that all ins and outs head towards the highway so someone doesn't actually turn down the other direction. Yeah. <laughs> Understand? Yeah. Well, Makes sense. there's a lot of work to do. But, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Take care, guys. Nice. Take care. Yep. Have a good Thanks, evening, guys. gentlemen. Cheers. All right. Uh, the other one here, uh, PZ-22-14, this is our, we've been <laughs> playing with this for a while, the text amendment application pertaining to the prohibition of cannabis establishments. I listened to the last meeting, uh, you know, some of it on there, and that Mr. Tehan gave me some consideration because I wasn't here that night, I believe. I, I'd like to give him the same and, uh, you know, have the, have the full commission here when we when we play with this one. And I, I did get the one about like expanding the uh, uh, the distances. Yeah. That's what the attorney recommended if we we're gonna go this route. Yeah, and yeah. just because right. Chris slaved the way at it, I wanna just show you what right. we have. Sounds good. So you can see what we're looking at to make, hopefully have it make a little more sense. This is in the thing and we'll, we'll leave it up. So he put together a map to give you an idea of what the most recently revised version, which is in the regs, um, includes and so this is revised after the last meeting um, based upon the discussion and trying to not make things more complicated effectively you'll see the revisions for november 21st um, <clears throat> we are striking all of the other uses from from the cannabis um, regs so the only thing that would be allowed would be retail okay um, and then basically increasing the criteria for retail so that it shall not be located on or within 1,000 feet of state interstate 84. So this red uh, <clears throat> hashing and, and shaded area here is the 1,000 foot buffer. And really what that does is to, to take the exits off of the, mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, <clears throat> so it takes out, um, basically this is the TA, this is the site that we just approved the pad and then these pieces over here this is this is loves um it gets effectively gets rid of those and then it, it prevents it from anything being located immediately right. off the highway and in the meantime the one that's already approved they're all set yeah, right perfect. so th that was the main issue is preserving the criteria yeah. so that we okay. had it for them i understand the only other thing that we did was i added something in that said basically shall not be located shall be located in a building at least fifteen thousand square feet in size so Phelps Plaza is more than 15,000. Um, I have a list from the assessor of all the buildings in excess of 15,000 in town, and there really aren't any others that would meet all the other criteria. Um, so we're, we're basically drilling down so that Phelps Plaza can have and continue to operate one facility okay. and then striking everything else, getting rid of any ability to do cultivation, um, production, all the other uses are are out. Um, I think that is closer to what folks are interested in. I, I'm interested in that. That, mm -hmm. that covers the basis it, and it, it leaves the one that's already approved <clears throat> in a good position. It would, it would yeah. make the uh, one now in Phelps non conforming, would it? No. Okay. All right. That's and what I, I know that was a concern. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Canvas out there. Agricultural program that would pay for this in the school. Mm -hmm. so, that's right. So. <laughs> they changed the statute so cannabis doesn't need the criteria but for I, that. I, but I would, I would like that. When they, when they when they approved cannabis laws, they amended the definition of, of agriculture in Connecticut to expressly exclude cannabis. You can have hemp, oh, but so you okay. can make rope. Yeah. Can I was make, reading make through it clothing. because yeah. we have to understand. Yeah. What the, from the town's perspective, we there's a, there's a process that basically we have to go through and with with the DCP because they have to report their um, monthly or annual or 
I think it's monthly or quarterly earnings. And then, then we have to invoice them for 3% of that, the town. So how that works and how that money comes in and then establishing a fund, and it's, um, it's still not, you know, not gonna be enough to pay for right. school. But. I would like to wait until John is here for this, seeing as he thought of me in the last meeting. Um, you know what, one good parent deserves another. So but, this is a, yeah. this is a, a, a bit of a, um, deviation from where we originally started. So we'll, we need to hold a hearing and do the proper referrals for that. So okay. if you think it's close enough, I can get that started. All right, I'm, I'm good with that. Just so we don't, we can kind of yes. keep it moving. Yep, okay. So we'll do that in the interim. Is it, is it, sorry, public comment? Not yet. No. You, we'll get there. But it's not supposed to be about anything on the agenda, but we'll, we'll be there in a minute. All right, so we got that one. Discussion and approval of uh, 2020, this is under new business item F, item two, since one was struck. Discussion and approval of 2023 meeting dates. Anyone have any conflicts that they see in those dates? I know it's hard to we'll take that as a in advance. Exactly. Were we talking about the seven o'clock start or the cat? I saw those in the minutes and stuff. Or are we just going with 7 30 unless it's well we, we wanted to talk about a cap on times and uh, and about I I don't think these meetings should last longer than 10 o'clock. I agree. Yeah, we, we need to do something, right? Either yeah. start early or finish yes. early or something. Yeah. But you know, to, to sit here after working a it's full day and then have yeah. to go to work the next day, you know, start at, even starting at 7:30, that's that, that's you know two and a half hours. Yeah. I, I think that's I think that's a pretty good run. I think that's adequate, really. You know, it's sitting down here till 11:30 at night, you know, that's but yeah, you know, I, I would like to, to do that. We well, we gotta make a does this need to be motioned and everything or no? No, just, 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 we can um, we can notate that okay. at the uh, on the meeting schedule yeah. unless otherwise agreed to by the commission. Agreed. If, if there's something that we feel that strongly about where we want to go later, I would like that option. But you know, as a matter of course, though, I think the meeting should end by ten at, at the latest. Yeah, as long as you're just you're not telling someone no, you can't participate. Yeah. We're gonna can't. We're going to no, join we'll, the meeting. So we won't do that to them. Well, you, you can do that yeah, even on a public hearing. We can continue exactly. it. There's, there's all kinds of options. We, right. we made sure people were heard <laughs> like during the, the whole deal with the distribution center. So, right. You can, you can absolutely do that. All right. Uh, and the meeting dates, everyone, everyone good with those? Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. When do we uh, do the officers and everything? Is that in January? First meeting. Okay. First meeting in January. Just for those that are new, we usually. You know, see who's going to be the chairman or so forth, secretary, vice chair, you know, in the first meeting in January. All right. Uh, item G, approval of minutes. Do we do a motion on the, on the, on the dates? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll make a motion to approve the meeting dates for the 2023 calendar year. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, uh, approval of minutes, uh, November 15th, 2022. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of November 15th, 2022. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. I'm going to have same as well. Okay. I read them. I wasn't here, but I read through the minutes and I listened to the, the online meeting. So, uh, item H, public participation for items not on agenda. Okay. Okay. Anyone in the uh, public, Nick Tella? Hey, Nick Tella, 49 Myrtle. I uh, just wanted to express. Uh, dissatisfaction that the um, 
regulations were not followed when it came to that cannabis store in Phelps Plaza. Again, I spoke before, you know, it said, clearly says within 500 feet of any child daycare facility and uh, also states any part of a lot used as such. Not, not a section of Phelps Plaza building. It says lot. Um, so the regulation clearly was uh, not, not adhered to. And uh, I hope somebody can challenge this uh, at, at some level because it is not, it's not appropriate that we can just disregard regulations that we have on the, on the books. So thanks. Hey, have a good night. It was, dis it was discussed with the attorney. It, the attorney it, no, but we don't go in a back and forth okay. or in public comment, Doug. Okay. We don't. It's fine. It's okay. Uh, I, I do have a question yep. about the, sorry, this is up here, Hussein, 48 Mile Road. I just had a question about the regulation for cannabis. And I was wondering, is there, similar to the ADU, is there a time frame that we're looking to put this regulation into play? Because it seems, I apologize for my lack of understanding, that there's something in place right now, but we're putting in more restrictive regulations going forward to kind of um, prevent additional distribution centers of cannabis in the town of Wellington. If my understanding is correct, please correct me. So seeing Mike's head shake yes, are we trying to get it done in a certain period of time, seeing that we're not voting on it tonight? That's my, it's a, it's a question. There's, I don't know there's no real answer. pressing. Nothing pressing. Pressing time frame. We got to do another public hearing since we're changing it and so forth. It's in, there's no guarantee how the commission will vote when we do vote on it. So correct. You can't Stay cap, back. we can't cap the number of <coughs> cannabis establishments in town. We can't just say Willington only that one. Right, we can't. So what we're doing is dialing in the criteria so that other places which would support them because you're you know, you're seeing some interest in parcels, particularly along the highway and other places, sort of trying to identify where they might go and take those locations off the eligibility list, if you will. And that's why I was asking about time frame because it's so it's, in other words, someone else can come along and put in an application like right now. Correct. It would still require a public hearing. You still require them to meet the criteria that are on the books now. Um, just trying to avoid the pain and suffering by saying, is there a timeline that we want to have it done by? So this, uh, based upon that, I will schedule the public hearing. So we have to refer to CROG and then schedule the hearing. So this will go to hearing um, in January. So we're, we're talking, you know, in, in the month of January, in theory, could have the revised version on the books and, and effective. And that's depending, like, you know, when it's commission will hear the public comment, we'll go through right. that, then we'll have a vote, we'll see how it lands. Okay, of course. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, and my correspondence. Uh, the only thing that there was was a referral from the Coventry Planning and Zoning Commission for an application that just came in. I'm just gonna verify that it's not uh, anything overly concerning. Um, Any regulation amendment coming to Oh, it's so Coventry is, is um, going through the process to consider and adopt cannabis regulations. Um, so they're they're proposing um, some of the stuff looks very similar. Um, so it's just a, a copy of their their proposed cannabis regulations. Okay. All right, item J, staff report and discussion. Item one is the SDZ moratorium. Yeah, so you, you just to keep everybody in the loop because of uh, the Thanksgiving holiday, we couldn't get the postings specified in the proper days to have a hearing for tonight. So that will be at the next meeting. So that'll be a public hearing to consider an adoption of a temporary moratorium on the SDZ based upon what was written and a revised two meetings ago now. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a public hearing to set that and set that to be effective. Okay, brings us to item K, adjournment. It is uh, <laughs> 8 55 p.m. meeting adjourned.